Well, God bless everyone tuning into this sermon on 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, 6 to 11. We'll read it and go to the Lord in prayer. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be sober having put on the breastplate of faith and love for the helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you for this word, this gospel truth. We pray that you'd use it to your glory. In Jesus' good name, amen. If Jesus were to come last night or come any time in the last seven days, at any random time, what would he have found you doing? Good question to think about. I remember we had a very strange babysitter when I was a child. This babysitter must have violated every babysitting code that there was out there. First, he brought movies that were certainly not appropriate for children to watch. Movies with bad language, movies with violence. And when he was not on the phone with his girlfriend or watching movies... He would be doing with us the most dangerous wrestling moves. Large body slams, throwing us from high up in the air, uh, coming down and jumping on us upon the bed. It was just like basically body slams, backbreakers, extreme jumping, extreme activity to say the least. As for bedtime, well, let's just say we didn't get into our room until our parents pulled up in the driveway, which was... Yet another broken rule. We were supposed to be in bed early. These evenings were more like a WrestleMania mixed with bad movies and junk food. But my brother and I noticed something while he was uh, babysitting us. He was always looking out the window to make sure my parents weren't coming. He was anticipating the return of my parents... They were coming back, and I'm sure if they hadn't come back, someone would have been in the hospital, the house would have been trashed, and there would have been no food. But we were all watching and anticipating their return. We didn't want to get in trouble, and he didn't want to get in trouble. But unfortunately, we were watching and waiting for the sole reason of not getting caught with all our misbehaviors. Is this how you or me want to live our Christian life? Just shaping up at the last minute, just putting everything in order at the last minute while the whole time we're unfaithful to the Lord Jesus and we've been rebellious and we'll just get ready just before we have to? Let us be anticipating the Lord Jesus' return and let us be faithfully obedient to Him as we anticipate and long for his coming. How we treated that evening was more along the lines of some people treat their lives, hoping for a deathbed conversion. Have as much fun as you want, but when you're at the just before the right time, you get serious about God. We broke every single rule that night, and when my parents came home, we ran into our beds and faked that we were sleeping. My parents were led to believe, oh, it was just an unbelievable night. The whole time we were up all night. We're in this final section on Paul's teaching on the second coming of Jesus, and we actually have some very close similarities between the previous passage in chapter 4, 13 to 18. For instance, Paul writes about the gospel, and then he encourages people that they will spend eternity with the Lord, and then he calls them and encourages them to encourage one another with these gospel truths. This section on the second coming of Jesus, chapter 4, verse 13 to 5, verse 11 
was written to deal with some serious concerns and issues that the Thessalonians had with the second coming of Christ. First, we know that certain people in this congregation, in light of the return of Christ, thought they didn't have to work. And Paul exhorts them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, 11 to 12, to be busy with their hands. Next, we know that the Thessalonians were concerned with their loved ones, those who had fallen asleep or died before the second coming of Jesus. And they wondered if these people who had died before the second coming of Jesus would partake in the hope of the resurrection. And Paul writes 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 to 18 to deal with that. And the third concern, of course, was the timing of the second coming of the Lord Jesus. They were wondering what is going on with the timing of the Lord Jesus. And Paul addresses that concern in chapter 5, verses 1 to 5, saying, Jesus will come like a thief in the night. And so today we can conclude our section on the second coming of the Lord Jesus, where Paul speaks about how we are to live. In light of the second coming of Jesus as well, Paul directs our focus again that in light of Christ's return, he brings us back to the good news, the gospel of the Lord Jesus, specifically in verse 9 and 10. And he encourages us to encourage and build one another up, just in fact as these Thessalonians were already doing. So today we have three points as we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 6 to 11. With my first point, verses 6 to 8, godly living. Second point, verse 9 and 10, God's election. Or you could even call it God's gospel. And final point, verse 11, good word. Good word. Let's look at godly living. So then, let us not sleep as others do, but let us keep awake and be sober. Paul starts this new section out with, so then, or it could be translated, so, or then therefore, or so therefore. Paul reminds them of what he's already said. He's going back to chapter 5, verse 4 and 5, where he writes, But you are not in darkness, brothers, for that day to surprise you like a thief, for you are all children of the light, children of the day. We are not children of the night or darkness. And then he says, so then, or so therefore. Because they are no longer people of the night or of darkness, meaning they no longer belong to the realm of sin. They've been delivered from the sin and they belong to the light or to the day, meaning now they now belong to the kingdom of the Lord Jesus. They are now the people of God. They are in the light. Because of the work of the Lord Jesus upon the cross and Christ shining his grace into the heart of sinful people, they are no longer darkened by sin. And because of the work of Christ, they are delivered. And if you're in Christ, you are delivered from the domain of darkness and brought to the kingdom of his beloved son, Colossians 1, 12-13. Because of all this glorious work, of Christ Jesus on the cross. Believers are saved and delivered. Praise the Lord. And because of all this, we are called to live sober and alert and awake lives. The work of Christ here really fulfills Psalm 36. Verse 9, for with you is the fountain of life. In your light we do see light. Because the Lord has revealed his light to us and given us life, we're called to action. When the Lord saves you, he just doesn't want to leave you in your sin. You don't stay in your sin. You are delivered from the bondage of sin and the cage of sin. And he saves you to new life and new living in the Lord. Just like we see here in this verse. We are called not to sleep. Let us not sleep, he says. Now this sleep word is a very different word that is used in verse 13 about those who have fallen asleep. It's a different Greek word, but it actually has similar meanings. 
This word can be used in 5 verse 6 of sleep to meaning actually sleeping. It's actually used with regards to the disciples as they sleep in the garden of Gethsemane. It can also mean that you are dead, that you've fallen into a sleep, which is a similar meaning to this different sleep word in 1 Thessalonians 4.13. But this word also has a different usage that's different than the first sleep word we looked at. It can mean that you're spiritually sleeping or spiritually indifferent or sleeping with regards to the Lord Jesus. Meaning you're dull and complacent with the Lord Jesus. You're dull. You have, you're apathetic. You don't care about the Lord Jesus. And in light of the gospel, the work of Christ in his second coming, these believers are not to be dull or to be sleeping towards their Lord and Savior. They are called to be awake and sober. First word, awake. This awake word can mean watchful or to be alert. It means you're not sleeping at the wheel with regards to the Lord. It's used numerous times, specifically in Matthew 24 and 25, as Jesus speaks about his own coming. Matthew 24, verse 42, Therefore, stay awake, for you do not know on what day your Lord is coming. Matthew 25, verse 13, Watch therefore, or be alert therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. The next thing he calls us to is to be sober. And this word can be translated as well, well balanced, or it can be self-control. Live a life of being in control and not living according to the passions of the lust. Basically, this word often means to be controlled under the power of God the Holy Spirit, where you're walking in powered, walking empowered by the Holy Spirit. Sober is in direct contrast to this next verse that speaks about drunkenness. When you're sober, you're awake, you're alert, you're self-controlled, but when you're drunk, you're dopey, not alert in the Lord. And both of these words call us to be continually mindful of Jesus Christ, His work on the cross, His grace, and being a diligent to apply that grace to our lives and His commands to our life. Peter actually combines both of, both of these words, sober and alert or awake, as he speaks about the characteristics and the schemes of Satan in 1 Peter 5 verse 8. Be sober-minded and be watchful. Why? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour. Let's go to verse 7. For those who sleep, sleep at night, and those who get drunk are drunk at night. Here Paul picks up the reference in the previous section of night and darkness. Those who are in darkness sleep, and they're apathetic to Jesus Christ and his work. They're in darkness. They live as in darkness and are sleeping. But Paul also brings up another activity that is done at night, drunkenness. Now I know someone, most people know someone, who says it's 4 o'clock somewhere, and they just can't live without drinking even in the morning. But for the most part, the activities of drunkenness do happen at night. Drunkenness is a sin. It's a work of the flesh. And drunkenness is so dangerous because we don't have the full use of our faculties, and we often do things that we should not do, that we normally would not do if we were not drunk. Ephesians 5.18 speaks about the danger of drunkenness. It says, Do not be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. We cannot be drunk and filled with the Holy Spirit at the same time. Drunkenness as well was a serious problem at the church at Corinth because they were even getting drunk at the Lord's table as they were trying to celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus. What Paul is getting at here is that the people of darkness do things of darkness. People of the night do things that the people of the night do. 
But here we get a big but in 5 verse 8 of 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 8. But since we belong to the day, the but is contrasting those who sleep and get drunk at night. Those outside of the Lord Jesus sleep at night. They get drunk at night. Those outside the Lord Jesus are people of the night. But these Thessalonians are not of the night. They are of the day. And they are of the light. These believers and all Christians, if you're a Christian, you are not a person of the day, of the night. You are a person of the day. Meaning that you have been made holy in God's sight. You've been delivered from the bondage of sin. You belong to God. Well, what does he say to those who belong to the day? Let us be sober. He calls them again to sobriety in the Lord. Being sober for the second coming of the Lord Jesus is a serious concern for Paul. The fact that he mentions be sober two times should make us sure and examine ourselves that we are living sober lives with the Lord Jesus. But he commands us to put on a couple of things here. Having put on the breastplate of faith, Verse 5, in love and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. Now Paul calls us to put on what we call spiritual armor. We are to avoid the evil deeds that are done in night, being apathetic to the Lord, His grace, His commands. We're to put off drunkenness, which leads to more wickedness. And we are called to put on spiritual armor or spiritual clothes that reveal that we truly are sober. This imagery actually comes from the book of Isaiah. The Lord puts on armor as he sees that there's no justice in the land of Israel. In Isaiah 59 verse 17, he says he puts on righteousness as a breastplate, the helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. But there are several other passages in the New Testament that speak about putting on armor. For instance, in Roman Romans 13, Paul speaks about putting on the armor of light. Romans 13, 12. The night is far gone, the day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness. Here we see that imagery of light and darkness. And put on the armor of light. The armor of light. Let us look at this armor that Paul calls us to put on. First, the breastplate of faith and love. Faith and love are essential to Christianity. Faith here, of course, when you look at the faith as, it use, as it's used in 1 Thessalonians, refers to their faith in Jesus Christ, their trust in the person and work of the Lord Jesus. And this breastplate is protection for your body to the blow of the sword or an arrow. Thus, faith protects you in the Lord. Next, love. Love refers to here in Thessalonians to two things. First, the love of God given to us. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 4, For we know, brothers, that you are loved by God. And it's put in a perfect tense, a completed action. But as well, this love that he could be referring to extends to others where you love one another. We sometimes see a culture in the church where love takes a back burner to people's personal agendas. Love goes all the way to the back and my agenda goes to the front. But we don't see this attitude in the Bible or in Thessalonians. They had an attitude of love for one another. Paul thanks God for their love in 1 Thessalonians 1.3. And their call, and Paul prays that their love would grow more and more. So the breastplate of the love of Christ, faith in Christ, the helmet of the hope of salvation. The helmet protects the head or your mind. And note what kind of helmet this is, the hope of salvation. The hope, meaning that hope is found in the person in work of the Lord Jesus, His grace given and life everlasting. The hope that God will bring with Him those who have fallen asleep to be with the Lord Jesus for eternity in 1 Thessalonians 4.14. 4, the hope in 4.17 of always being with the Lord forever and ever. When we often think of this salvation, we often 
limit salvation to just forgiven sins, but we cannot neglect the hope of salvation that we serve a living a living and risen Savior and because of His resurrection we have the hope of everlasting life with Him away from the sinful body and sinful world. As we wait for the Lord Jesus, Paul calls all, us to put on the gospel, faith in the work of Christ, to remind us of the love of Christ, and to remind us of the hope of Christ. These are the very three themes that are brought up in the start of the letter in chapter 1, verse 2 to 3. If you go back to the first chapter, the first, the start of the main letter, we give thanks to God always for all of you constantly mentioning you in our prayers. Remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfast hope in our Lord Jesus. So we have godly living. Godly living. Now we have God's election in verse 9 and 10. Paul, in the midst of this section of the coming of Jesus, reminds them again of the gospel. Verse 9, For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Here we see the amazing truth of God's election. Those who are saved are not destined for wrath. If you're in Christ, you're not destined to bear the anger of God for your sin, which you most properly deserve to bear for eternity. You are not destined to bear what you rightfully deserve. God is right to have anger at our sin because he's a pure and holy God, but God is not destined or determined his people to bear wrath for their sin. Notice the contrast. But God is not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation. We see this contrast. We're not destined for this, but God allows us, destines us, for salvation. We see this contrast in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1 to 4. And you were dead in the transgressions and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, rich in mercy because of the great love with which He loved us, He saved us. This salvation that Paul is referring to is being rescued from the wrath we deserve. Remember, Jesus is described in 1 Thessalonians 1.10. Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. Because of Christ... We are not destined for wrath because of Christ's work. We absolutely need to highlight this salvation does not come from our works, but the grace of God that comes to us. First, we weren't destined for this salvation. It was We had no part of it. But next, we were destined for this salvation that comes through Christ. It is because of Christ and His work alone on the cross that we receive His grace, the salvation. Through Christ, God rescues us from the wrath of God that we deserve to bear because of our own wickedness. Think about all the sins you've committed. Maybe you're watching this and you're not even a believer. And maybe you don't even think what sin is is even sin. Maybe you think it is something that's good. Think about the pride. Think about not giving God the honor the God who made you, the honor he deserves. Think about all the times you use the Lord's name in vain. All the theft, all the covetousness, all the hate. God is a righteous and holy God and hates sin and he will punish sin. But God in his grace destines us to be free from the authority and the punishment of our sin and to obtain the sure blessings in Christ. Praise the Lord. And he continues on. How does he... Deliver us from this wrath of God, 5 verse 10, who died for us, so whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. 
This verse is very similar to what Paul has previously said in 4.14, for we believe that Jesus died. But Paul says Jesus died for us. For us. His death was for our benefit. This is a very simple verse about the depths of the love of God, but the love of God is very deep. We know that Jesus died for us means that he died for our sins. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 3 For what I delivered to you as a first importance, what I also received, that Christ Jesus died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. Jesus dies on the cross. He bears the wrath of God as a substitute in our place for the punishment of our sins. Because of Christ, whether we are alive or dead, we might live with Him. We might live with Him in this life and live with Him in the life to come. So we have godly living, godly living. We have God's election and finally good word. Therefore, encourage one another and build one another up just as you're doing. Therefore, because of the gospel of Jesus Christ, because of the hope of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, Paul calls us to do two things. Encourage one another. This, mean can word, this word can mean exhort or command, but Paul has in mind what Christian fellowship looks like. Encouragement in the good news and encouragement in the word of God. If you're the type of person that when you're around believers, you want to trash this believer, trash that believer, you've got it all wrong. Encouragement in the Lord. Fellowship around Christ and His Word to us. And if you're that type of person that when you get around someone, all you want to do is trash other people and be negative about other people, you need to repent. We're to encourage one another with these words. We're also to build up one another. <clears throat> And this was the main pro one of the main problems in the church in Corinth. They were not building up with love. A lot of them had knowledge, and it puffs up. Love builds up. 1 Corinthians 8.1 And as well, this was the problem with those who had the spiritual gift of tongues. They were building themselves up instead of building up the church. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 4 and 17 But God has called us to live lives of love to one another and build each other up. <clears throat> well, there's lots to apply in this passage. But first, I want us to think about the good news of grace, gospel grace. There is hope for people in troubled times. And we are in troubled times. People are troubled. People are fearful. People are angry. If you're in the Lord Jesus, there's some amazing blessings that you need to ponder today, even in this passage. First, in Christ, you are not destined for wrath. The punishment that you deserved to bear for your sin is forgotten and dealt with on the cross. That wrath and punishment that you deserve to bear has been bore upon Christ by means of his work upon the cross. I love Romans 3, specifically Romans 3.25, whom God put forward, he put forward Jesus, as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This word propitiation means that Christ when in our place, bore the wrath of God and thus forgave our sin. He took the punishment so we could be free. And he continues, this was to show God's righteousness because in his divine forbearance he passed over former sins. You are not destined for punishment. You are destined for joy in Christ. Through Christ we can obtain salvation and all the benefits of knowing Christ. Because of Christ's work, through faith in Him, we belong to God's family. Maybe you're alone. You're not alone with the Lord. You have Him. You have the family of God. We have peace with God because our sin brought hostility between us and God. We have our sins forgiven completely. I think of Colossians chapter 2 where it says the glorious truth. And you were dead in, uh, in your, in your trans trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh. 
God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all, 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 all our trespasses. And he canceled that record of debt that stood opposed to us and was against us. And number three, we will live with Christ for eternity. Praise the Lord. We can experience the presence of God and the power of this Holy Spirit here on earth. But we have a greater hope that in the full, we will have the fullness of the presence of Christ at, a, at, his de- at our death or at his second coming. And we will experience what true eternal life is. Away from the sadness and sorrow and sin of our world. And if we've ever seen seen sadness, sorrow and sin, it has been in the last year. But heaven will not be like what we've went through in the last year. Freedom, full freedom. Away from the sorrow. God will wipe his our tears from our eyes. That's the joy of the gospel grace. Christian, are you thankful? Today, though, if you do not know the Jesus personally, you do not know these glorious truths, I encourage you to look into the Bible and see His grace for yourself. That's what I had to do. I had to get into God's Word. I had to get into God's Word myself. And God used the reading of His Word to teach me about Jesus, and He saved me. So I encourage you, shut off the Netflix. Shut off the Internet. Or if you don't have a Bible, you can just log into BibleGateway.com and learn for yourself or download the YouVersion Bible app or the ESV Bible app and read the Bible for yourself. Next, Christians, how are we to live as we anticipate the coming of the Lord Jesus? Paul gives us four things quickly here as we anticipate and long for his coming. First, let us live sober. Let us live self-controlled lives. This means that we live by the power of the Holy Spirit. We live a life guided by God and His Word. This means that we're not carried by the culture's flavors of the week because they cancel another flavor week after week. We don't go along with the crowd of the world. This means that we're standing firm in God's Word. We control our passions, our desires. We don't walk in anger, lust, selfishness, and covetousness. Hear what 1 Peter says in 1.13, Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Because you have this new birth and a living hope to the resurrection of the dead, prepare your minds for action. He uses this word, be sober-minded. Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Next, we need to be alert and ready and prepared. We need to be a people who are truly prepared. Imagine if there was a catastrophe that you knew that was coming for sure. Would you not prepare for it? We need to continue in the grace of God and obedience to God. Let us be a people who are stirred by the word of God and live in obedience daily to Christ and are ready for the coming of Jesus. Third, we need to put on this spiritual armor. We're in difficult times and we are in a spiritual battle. Satan is real. But yet sometimes we try and think and and put in our minds that he's not, but he is real. And when you look at the armor, even in 1 Thessalonians, in the other passage, Ephesians 6, you see that putting on the armor is putting on the gospel of Christ. Think about what Paul said in Ephesians 6, 13-17. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that may be able to withstand the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as the shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit which is the word of God. Did you put on your gospel armor today? Did you preach the good news to yourself of getting into God's word and reminding yourself of the grace of Christ and his work, his defeat of Satan on the cross? Did you put on your spiritual armor? And finally, we're called to encourage and build up. Paul has already said that to them in 4 verse 18, but he says it again because it's very, very important How much more do we need encouragement now? 
And this is something that extends far beyond the worship service of encouragement. It ought to be doing, we ought to be doing this to one another throughout the week. Checking in, praying with one another, and encouraging each other in the Word of God. Jesus is coming soon. But are you going to be prepared? Or are you going to be like how we acted on the babysitting nights, doing the bare minimum, hoping to get away with as much nonsense and goofiness as possible till my parents came home? How are you going to live your life? I pray that you live for the Lord Jesus, faithfully serving Him, being sober, being ready, putting on the gospel, and encouraging one another and building each other up. Amen.